Hello, my name is Dr Bernard Gallagher and I was until recently a reader in social work at the University of Huddersfield and I have 30 plus years experience in child protection research. As I say, I left the university recently and I'm now working as a freelance researcher and writer. The subject of my talk today is COVID-19 and the lockdown and the impact that's had upon child safeguarding. And in particular, I want to challenge the received wisdom around this issue, or what I see as groupthink. Now, the idea for uh, this talk and the number of uh, small articles I've written on this subject um, came from some of the media coverage of the lockdown and child safeguarding uh, back in March. At that time, uh, Anne Longfield, the Children's Commissioner for England, was being interviewed about uh, risks to children and she said social workers should be knocking on doors, as if to imply they weren't knocking on doors, whereas in actual fact um, it's been established that social workers are still going out visiting uh, families at risk. And interestingly, the other uh, uh, event that you know, uh, got me interested in this topic. We're seeing a BBC Newsnight, BBC Two Newsnight interview again with Anne Longfield and Peter Wanless, the chief executive of the NSPCC. And again, they were talking about child safeguarding, but there was no social work representative uh, being interviewed. And, it, and, and social workers do have the uh, single largest responsibility for child protection in the United Kingdom. So I thought that was a bit odd that social workers weren't being involved. So anyway, these events got me thinking about how the media, uh, politicians and other stakeholders, and indeed even the public, how they're perceiving child safeguarding in the time of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there were two particular issues I was interested in. Firstly, are children really that much more at risk from spending so much more time at home during the lockdown? And secondly, do schools or can schools protect children from child abuse and neglect as much as has been said? And those are the two major issues I want to um, investigate. First of all, I'd like to say that there has been you know, a definite risk to ch that um, children might experience more child abuse and neglect from being at home. In some ways, this could be uh, anticipated because if children spend more time at home with their parents, then, you know, all things being equal, uh, you know, the risks will increase. There's also specific specific reasons for thinking why the risk to children might have increased. Parents may, during the lockdown, have suffered unemployment. They may have financial, may have financial worries that have more childcare to do and homeschooling. And all of those factors combined that could have created more pressure and stress for parents. And that may have led to more child abuse and neglect. Now, some children will have been especially vulnerable, and this will include children where there's domestic abuse in the home, where the parents have mental health problems or issues of substance misuse. And then even more so, those parents aren't getting the support, the psychosocial support they would previously have done because of the lockdown. That might have heightened the risk to their children still more. So it's clearly you know, some reasons for thinking that child abuse and neglect may have increased during the lockdown. There's also if issues of sibling bullying and online uh, bullying and exploitation. And there have been re uh, increasing reports of those going on during the lockdown. But as I said, I want to tackle some of the group think around these issues. And the one particular form of maltreatment that stands out for me and has not been addressed is child sexual abuse. Now, much child sexual abuse happens in and around the family home. And child sexual abuse requires privacy and secrecy. 
that with more people around the child's home, there's more uh, eyes and ears, if you like, and that might have actually deterred and prevented some child sexual abuse. And I think that's been missed out upon in all this discussion about child safeguarding during the pandemic. It's also possible that some parents have been less stressed. They may not have been working, not commuting, not having a ferry, the children around, maybe not responsible for um, members of their extended family. So their lives may have been less hectic, less pressured, and that may have led to a decrease in some child abuse and neglect. And while not wanting to downplay all of the problems associated with uh, the pandemic and the lockdown, um, it has to be said that some, ch some children and young people have enjoyed having their parents around more and, and vice versa. You know, parents uh, have spoken about being able to spend more time with their children. The second major issue I want to address in my talk today is about the role of schools in child safeguarding. I want to say, first of all, that I am very aware of the vital role that teachers and other school staff play in both detecting and reporting child abuse and neglect. And that leads not only to the cessation of some of this child abuse and neglect, but also the prevention of some of these cases in the first place. I'm also very well aware of the equally important work that teachers and school staff do, other school staff do, in terms of supporting children and nurturing children, and not only vulnerable children and, and their problems, but children and young people in general and their problems. That's an equally uh, a vital role. But I think it's also important to ask ourselves about the extent to which schools can really protect children. The mandatory school age in the United Kingdom is four to 16 years, which means in, in principle that for about a third of their lives up to 18, children and young people aren't at school. Also, when children are at school, they may not be at school. And by that, I mean to say that the school day runs from nine to 3.30. This means that children aren't at school between 3.30 in the afternoon and nine o'clock the following morning. Children also don't go to school on the weekends, nor the holidays. And I did a rough calculation and I estimated that children of school age actually spend only 14% of their time at school, 86% of the time they're not at school. So I think that's a useful sort of a couple of figures really, but getting in perspective uh, the extent to which schools can really protect children. And it also has to be recognised that sometimes uh, harmful things happen to children at school. The Crime Survey for England and Wales uh, did a survey amongst 11 to 15 year olds and they found that 17% of 11 to 15 year olds had been bullied and in a way that frightened or upset them in, in the past year. The NGO Plan International did a survey amongst girls in the UK and found that one third of girls had been sexually harassed at school. And although rare, you can sometimes get child abuse and neglect being perpetrated at school, either by other children and young people or adults. It's also important uh, to ask ourselves, how do children and young people feel uh, when they're at school? Or how do they feel about school? The Children's Society did a survey amongst 10 to 17 year olds in England, Scotland and Wales and they asked them about 10 major areas of their lives. The one area of their life that children were most happy with was their relationships with their family members. Uh, only 4% of children said they were unhappy in this respect. Of those 10 areas, the one area that children and young people were least happy with 
was with school. 12% of children and young people said they were unhappy at school. In a separate survey, but in the same publication, the Children's Society reported on a survey with just 14 to 15 year olds, where they asked them about their feelings of safety. Only 2% of children said they felt unsafe at home, compared to 9% of children uh, or young people who said they felt unsafe at school. So schools do perform an important safeguarding role. They also nurture children and support children, but it has to be recognised that there is also victimisation of children at school. And partly what I'm trying to do in my talk is to get over the complexity and the nuances of child safeguarding during the pandemic and in particular lockdown. And I think this is also, these complexities are reflected when we look at the community. The National Police Chiefs Council uh, released preliminary statistics during the course of the, the, the major lockdown for England and Wales. And they reported that police recorded assaults and personal robberies declined by 30%. Police recorded rapes fell by 28% although it has to be noted that domestic abuse incidents uh, that were recorded increased by 4%. But there have also been reports of falls in knife crimes against young people during the lockdown, and also reports of young people being more able and willing to resist being drawn into criminal exploitation during the pandemic. So in conclusion, I would recognise and accept that there will have been some additional incidents of child abuse and neglect to children in their family homes. And some children may have experienced more sibling bullying, more online bullying and exploitation. And you know, many of these incidents would have been missed and, and, and not addressed by the authorities because teachers uh, and, and school staff haven't been able to um, you know, pick them up basically and report them. But as I've said, I think child safeguarding during the lockdown, during the pandemic is quite complex. Some child sexual abuse may have been prevented. I think there may have been in a quite dramatic drops in school-based bullying, sexual harassment and other forms of victimisation. In addition, some children will have been less unhappy and also less fearful because they have not been at school. Now the lockdown is uh, now being eased and schools in Scotland and Northern Ireland return this week and schools are returning uh, are opening again to all children in England and Wales next week. That said, the future of the pandemic uh, is uncertain. We already have a number of local lockdowns across the United Kingdom. And even with some of the schools opening, I think particularly in Scotland, some children are being sent home to quarantine because of outbreaks of COVID. So it's very difficult to say what will happen with the pandemic going forward. But I would say, uh, I would acknowledge again, that there have been costs because of the lockdown in terms of child safeguarding, but there's also been gains. And I think moving forward, I think the challenge is going to be, how can we avoid those costs in the future while retaining the gains that, that have been made? Thank you very much.